Hello, boys and girls. I'm Pearl of Wisdom, and you're listening to my NHL Pearls of Wisdom. And we are doing an ongoing series on the toughest players for each team to sign in the NHL. I got this from an article on Bleacher Report from Franklin Steele, who coincidentally called it the toughest players each team has to sign in the offseason. And I thought it was interesting. I didn't read the article, though. I am doing it by reaction. So I'm doing this completely on the fly. We're going to look at each player, uh, what it would take to sign them, if the team should sign them, and maybe even if I agree that it is the toughest player to sign for every team. You're going to want to be part of all of this fine content. So sub yourself up. And uh, I'll be doing trade videos. I already did trade videos. We just traded Gibson in the offseason for Anaheim. Uh, go check that one out as well. We're going to be doing other free agents, uh, playoff videos, all kinds of videos of that nature. If you're into that sort of thing, sub yourself up. And you can also come on the NHL Pearl of Wisdom Show, where I do live hockey um, about three, four times a week during the week when I feel like it, when I have time. And uh, you can come on and tell me all that you want to talk about, about your team, these players that I'm about to talk about now, or anything else, NHL. This is the Steel Flyers All Sports Network. It's part of the Steel Flyers All Sports Network. If you like the four major teams, more major sports and teams on those four major sports, you'll like Steel Flyers All Sports Network. Okay, so let's take a look at this video. I already did up until... The Montreal Canadiens are doing an alphabetical order. Today we're going to go from Nashville to San Jose. And we're going to look at each one, how they fit into each team's cap, and whether they should sign or not sign each player. Let's take a look. All right. Oh, we're starting with Nashville Predators and Philip Forsberg. Or Philip Forsberg. Um First question that people are going to ask when looking at Philippe Forsberg, I imagine, is are they going to be able to sign him at all? Uh, it's going to be an expensive signing. Now, he was available at the trade deadline. Chose They chose not to uh, trade him. So it basically makes you think that signing him is the way that Nashville is going. Now, that would probably mean that they're not looking towards a rebuild, which was something that a lot of people thought he made, they may decide to go down to this year. Uh, they are in a playoff race as they speak right now, and he is certainly a big part of that. He's only 27 years old. Uh, now, this says they essentially have to back a brick truck up to the forwards driveway and hope it gets done. I agree. He's got all – Forsberg holds all the cards here. The question is, how much is it going to cost? Estes is spot on. You know, Forsberg and his camp are aware of the fact that they have Nashville over a barrel, of course. Uh, values a center north of $11 million. It's funny. He says he's a center here. He can play center, but he seldom does. He usually plays win. But if he's going to value himself as a center, $11 million could be something that they're looking at. But let's look at uh, – but Poyle will be willing to shell out more than $10 million a season to Forsberg on the roster. Well, let's see if they're willing to do that. Uh, Philip Forsberg, I got, look at him right here. Uh, he made $6 million up until now. And this year – he had 76 points in 64 games, which is huge, huge so far. It's not even over yet. He's got lots of time to go ahead. He has seldom played a full season. He does seem to have injuries throughout the season, which will definitely lessen the value. But before now, he really never touched the point to game mark almost in 2017 18 this is his contract year and all and all of a sudden he goes off where he could be looking at about 95 uh points somewhere around there now the thing is here we'll look at uh, their cap space which i believe they have lots um nashville has been on the bubble of a playoff team for quite some time there one one, win one round and go out. 
uh, not really what you would call, what most people would call, a contender for an actual Stanley Cup. That's why a lot of people were thinking that uh, it was maybe even a little bit surprising that he wasn't traded at the deadline to use to get some young players, some draft picks, and build this team in a different direction. But they didn't, so a different direction doesn't seem to be the plan. They have Johansson and Matt Duchesne already making $8 million a year, which they signed a while ago. And now they have Forsberg, who is up to a 95-point season. Now, if you look at just plain numbers, he probably isn't worth $11 million. So that's reserved for players like Marner and Panarin, which are close to 100-point players on a regular basis. However, if you look at value to this team and what they uh, and what it would mean to lose him for nothing, if he wants to go for 11, I imagine they will have no choice but to give him that $11 million. Now, they have the cap space to do that. They have $27 million in cap space, as you can see here. For this year, for next year, uh, they got some guys to sign and Benning and Harper, uh, you know, whatever they want to do with Riddich, uh, Luke Cunning, you know, not overly too many players to sign. And even if they did give them 11 million, they would still be under the cap for the following year. So I think they've already worked out a number my inkling is that it's going to be somewhere in the $10 million mark. And my inkling also is that they will sign him. Now, they could, if it doesn't work out, if they don't want to pay what Forsberg is asking, they could trade his rights because I'm not sure if you know this, but a team is not able to offer a, a player an eight-year deal unless they own his rights. So if he goes to free agency... Anyone else out there has to give only a seven-year deal unless they acquire his rights before free agency and then they can give him an eight-year deal. So with that, they have a little bit of leverage in the sense that they can give him an eight-year deal. So if they give him 10 for eight, that's 80 million. Another team would have to match that at about 11 where he could get this, almost the same amount of money for seven years. My inkling is it'll be 10 to 10 and a half. Uh, he probably loves Nashville. He wants to stay there. All of those sort of things like that. So he may take a bit of a discount. It's possible that he really could take a big discount because somebody like Josie, who's already won a, uh, a major award, took nine for several years, not too long ago. Maybe he goes nine and a half, somewhere in that nature area where it gives the team a little more room to add some more free agents and be able to go for it a little more than they can right now. That's where I think it's going to sign. What do you guys think, Nashville fans? Sub yourself up and tell me, how much do you think Forsberg is worth? Would you sign him for eight years? Remember, he's 27 years old. That'll put him to 35 years old. Um or should they just let him go in? Or do you think that they should have traded him in the first place and did an actual rebuild? That's a good question as well. Next, let's see what we got here. New Jersey, Jesper Bratt. Okay, yes, that is going to be a very difficult signing. No doubt about it. Um, it says here in the article that um, he's already a star of the New Jersey Devils. He's established himself as part of the core uh, they're going to have their hands full trying to figure out how to structure his offers to the 23-year-old. Biggest reason why is not too long ago, Nico Heischer, their, well, sort of number one center, I guess. Hughes would really be their number one center. But their captain signed for $7.25 million. Heischer's put up better numbers than, or sorry, uh, Brad has put up better numbers, especially recently, than uh, Heischer. But again, Heischer is the captain and he is a center. So what are we, what are we going to look at for Brad? How much do you figure that Brad deserves to get or should get if uh, on this contract? Another thing they could do, of course, here is 
Uh, I just pressed the wrong one. Another thing they could do is give them another bridge. However, that would be dangerous considering how well he's been progressing up until now. Uh, he's 23 years old. Um, if you gave him a three-year bridge, you would bring him till he was 26, in which case you could sign him for a less of a contract. So let's look at him. 32 points at 21 years old in 60 games, 30 points in 46 games at, uh, say, 21-20, 21, 21, or sorry, 20, 22 years old, and 70 points in 71 games in this year, which is almost a point a game. It's fantastic. He's shown that he's improving every year. I think it would be within their best interest, if they could, to sign him up as long as possible right now. And if they can use the leverage that he sure is the standard in which they're going to sign him at, they can make a pretty good case, I would say, to get him at $7 million a year for eight, which would bring him to being 31 years old. Now, Jesper Bratz camp can say, hey, I'm not he sure. <laughs> uh, he took a sweetheart deal. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean I have to. I think I'm going to gamble on myself and take a bridge at three years. The number for that, probably about four and a half to five million, I would say. Do you agree, New Jersey fans? By the way, I'm doing this completely on the fly. It's a surprise to me which player each one of them picks. And if you like this contact, sub yourself up uh, and uh, tell me all about what you think Jesper Bratt should be worth. Personally, if they can get him at seven million or even seven and a half, to tell you the honest truth, for eight years now at 23 years old, with how he has steadily progressed, uh, he's got a killer shot. He looks like he's just going to get better and better. That could end up being a sweetheart deal. Now, if I'm Jesper Bratt, I might be thinking, I agree, that's a sweetheart deal. So if you're going to sign me up to that now, it's still going to be a sweetheart deal if you give me 8 to 8.5. And they're going to have to work out a number somewhere in between that. I think about 7.5, 7.75 for eight years is about where it's going to land. Tell me what you guys think, uh, New Jersey Devils fans. A lot of people want would like to go with the bridge contract and then see make sure that he's going to be what – you think he's going to be and then sign him after that. That can get very expensive three years down the road. Now, for New Jersey, they have a lot of cap space, but they're going to have a lot of young players that they're going to have to sign. They're going to have to fill J.P. Uh, P.K. Subban's spot. I doubt he's going to be re-signed. They got Miles Wood. Pavel Zaka is going to be a difficult one as well. He's put up some okay numbers, but... Uh, what is he going to sign for? And then next year, you got Sharon Govich, Kalkinen, and McLeod. That's a lot more raises coming up. So that $27 million is going to shrink quite a bit. Personally, I'm going for a long term. I'll do it at 7.75. What do you think out fans out there? 7.75 for eight years. Too much? Too little? Tell me in the comments. Sub yourself up and tell me in the comment section. All right, let's look at what the next one. Noah Dobson, New York Islanders. That is going to be a very difficult contract. Uh, this was, if I remember correctly, this has been his best year. It says here in the article, he had a breakout amidst of a breakout campaign, uh, already having nearly twice as many points this season as previous, at 40. And... Uh, yeah, well, that he had in his rookie and sophomore seasons combined. He's progressed. He's played a fair amount of minutes. He's moving up the roster very fast. He holds all the cards here in the sense of if he wants to do a long-term contract. Now, unlike New Jersey that we just talked about, the Islanders have bigger issues because, and we'll look at it here, they have salary cap issues. And when salary cap issues rear their ugly head, it makes it so there's less options of what you can do for a player. Here's their salary, $12 million a year, or $12 million for next year. That's their salary. That's their cap space is what I'm trying to say. There we go, cap space. So 
Noah Dobson. We got to look when I I, look, I find when you're looking at these uh, contracts, you got to look at it from all sides. Noah Dobson's 22. There is no doubt that the New York Islanders do hold the cards here. He doesn't have um, any rights basically at all. There's no arbitration or anything at this age. So they can just flat out say, look, we're going to do a bridge. Uh, we'll try to make you happy, which you would have to do if you're going to do a bridge, because otherwise at the end of the bridge, the player is going to be like, you know what? You screwed me over on my bridge contract. I don't think I want to sign long term and move their butt out of here. What does Noah Dobson deserve at this? And you're going to hear this a lot from me. Um, in almost every situation like this, if possible, at 22, I would try to sign him up long term. The problem with Noah Dobson, and the article did talk about it as well, is that the guys he's going to be looking at are like Adam Fox, Charlie McAvoy, McAvoy and Cal McCarr, who are making a heck of a lot of money right now. But you can put him in that category. Maybe not as good as them. He hasn't won in Norris, such as Adam Fox. And Charlie McAvoy is definitely the number one in Boston. They're beast. And, of course, Cal McCarr may win a Norris this year. Fantastic player. So I would put him definitely a little less than those guys. Uh, which are right around probably the eight. Um, the Cars contract might be 10. I'm thinking if I'm Noah Dobson here, I am going to to look at, I'm going to look at the Islanders and say, if you want to sign me for eight years until I'm 30, in which case I'm selling off a bunch of unrestricted free agent years where I could hit pay dirt. I want eight. I want $8 million a year for eight years. And the Islanders can snivel with that all they want. But honestly, Noah Dobson is going to be probably their number one defenseman in a couple of years, if not next year. I love Scott. I love Pulak. And I know he's making five. And Islanders fans are going to say, there's no way they can make more than Ryan Pulak. He's our number one. Okay, Noah Dobson has much better tools than Pulak and Pelik, um, as far as offensive tools are concerned. Also, Ryan Pulak took a just plain out sweet deal at $6 million a year. And Pelic did too at 5.7. All right, is Noah Dobson going to line up with that and say, I'll take six for eight because I don't want to make more than Ryan Pulak? I highly doubt it. This is possibly a you know, going to be in Norris conversations, young defensemen. Ryan Pulak and Pelic have never even, I don't think they've ever put up his kind of numbers. Let me see Pulak. He would be the most offensive of the two. 17, 35 points in 68 games one year. Already, we can bring up uh, Dobson's numbers here. Already at 22 years old, Noah Dobson's hit 40 this year. 40 points this year. 43 points for that matter. Is he as good defensively as Pulak and, and uh, Pelic? Maybe not yet, but he certainly isn't that bad. He's, he's actually really good, especially for 22 years old. And in some way, you have to go up by a projection here on what he's going to be. You're not going to keep – I'm not going to take if I'm uh, – Noah Dobson, I'm not going to take a contract based on how many points I had this year and give you an eight-year deal. If I'm going to do that, we're going to go bridge. You can bridge him at probably half of what he would get, maybe a little more than that, on a full eight-year deal, which I believe will be $8 million a year. So you're looking at four to four and a half. In which case... For the Islanders' sake, as we've said before, if they were to give him eight million, that would only leave them four million to sign all the rest of their players after this, and it would make it difficult to fill out their roster. No doubt about it. Personally, I don't care about that. If I'm a general manager, I'm looking at the future of this organization, and down the road. As you got to sign, and you got Matthew Barzal to sign next year too. That's what even makes it more difficult. Um, he's going to be looking for probably nine million dollars a year, which 
he is going to make it even diff more difficult to fill out your roster. But the problem is you've already made this mess for yourself. I think signing bridge deals just keeps on creating the mess down the road. If you can get him signed for eight, four, five years down the road, that eight is going to look probably extremely good if you believe in the player. If you believe this player is going to be a top two, $8 million a year, five years from now is going to look sweet. I'm doing it. Uh, and whatever the rest of the, it looks like, fine. I doubt the Islanders are doing it, though. I think they give them a bridge probably for about three years so they can fill out their roster and they have money to sign Barzal next year. Also, you got Wallstrom coming up as well, who's going to be a difficult signing. So Islanders fans, sub yourself up and tell me in the comments section, what do you think you would do with Mr. Noah Dobson? Sign him long term, sign him short term, give him a bridge, give him a really small bridge, like two, three years. And then you got to sign him to even more when uh, more maybe more contracts come off here, like next year. The year after next, you got Josh Bailey will be getting less. Uh, Anthony Beauvillier, who knows what he's going to get. Um, I just signed him for eight. I'm looking four or five years down the road where that contract will look sweet. And I can restructure my contracts accordingly and give longer term contracts to guys at hopefully good deals to have a superior roster four or five years down the road. Tell me what you think, New York Islanders fans. That's what I would do. All right, let's look at the next team. The New York Rangers, Ryan Strom. Ryan Strom is the most difficult contract they have next year. Um, everything I'm hearing about Ryan Strom and the fact that they brought in somebody like Andrew Kopp uh, to bring to take a large run in the cup, I think it, bringing in Andrew Kopp does more than that. I think it pretty much replaces Ryan Strom. Uh, Ryan Strom hasn't put up st stupendous numbers for a guy who has played alongside Panarin a lot of the time. And we'll look at that in a second. Uh, from what I understand, I think I read something where Ryan Strom said he would be willing to give a deal to the Rangers and sign for 6.5. That's the deal? All right. Let's look at Ryan Strom here, and uh, we'll look at their ca the the uh, Rangers cap space first as well. That's the most important thing. Only eleven million dollars next year in cap space, with lots of players to sign. Um, if they want to bring Frank Vitrano back, which I think is going to be difficult because he'll get more than what he had before. Uh, Andrew Kopp that we just mentioned, they brought over Winnipeg. I doubt they brought him over just as a rental. They gave up quite a bit for him. I think they, you know, I'm looking at Andrew Kopp at about five, maybe something like that. And I think what they'll end up doing is giving Andrew Kopp five for as, as many, for a lot of years. Hopefully they can get away with six, but honestly, I think if Andrew Kopp goes on the market with his type of versatility and, you know, 50 point point production and all of those sort of things like that and great defensive play, somebody may pony up a really long contract to get to acquire his services at that five. But you can use him as a second line center instead of Ryan Strom, who you would then, of course, have to just let go. But let's look at his numbers here. This year, he had 50 points in 69 games. In 82, he's probably going to be in the 54 mark. Uh, when his best year production-wise was in 2020, where he had who is almost a 60-point center. Not bad. Uh, you know, almost 20 goals, 50 to 60-point center is great to have. No doubt about that. I'm just not sure I want to pony up seven million for a long-term contract for a center that got 60 points playing with Panarin. Is it possible that Cop could almost get similar numbers for that? Um, so, again, is that really the most pressing contract or most difficult contract for them? Um, I, I think Cop might be. Because if they can get him for five, then 
Brian Strom is going to be let go. It's difficult to do because you're not getting anything for him. I don't think anybody's going to pony up money to get his rights so they can give him an eight-year deal. Not money, but prospects. To give him an eight-year deal um, because he'll be 36 by the end of that deal. He'll probably get somewhere around six years. And if if he pulls out that seven, seven and a half, then sorry, we got to let you go. What do you think, uh, New York Rangers fans? Should you sign Strom? Should you give him that large contract? We got lots of contracts coming up here. Um, where is it? Schneider's going to need a contract? I mean, that won't be. K. Andre Miller in two years is going to need a contract. The cap space is getting thin, and I think the Rangers are going to have to be pretty wise with where they give it to now. I don't think Ryan Strom is going to be one of those people. Ranger fans, what do you think? How much do you think Strom would get? Sub yourself up and let me know in the comment section what you think. Next. Okay. Ottawa Senators, Chris Tierney. Chris Tierney is... uh. Kind of odd. Oh, we'll take a look at what other ones would be if there's anyone else that they have to sign. But I think if Chris Tierney is your biggest problem, it's not much of a problem. I do believe he made $3.5 million last year, something like that. Um, and But he's primarily a defensive center, and he's not all that great at it. His offensive numbers have dipped. Um, and there's a lot of young guys, as they say in the article here, coming up. Uh, let's look at who else they have to sign in Ottawa that maybe um, they got. I mean, they have lots of cap space. We don't even have to look at that. They're basically a, uh, at the cap floor right now. In fact, they, they're one of the lowest salary teams in the NHL. Here, Joshua Norris. Wouldn't that be the more difficult one? Uh I would sign Tierney maybe if he wants to sign for a million or so. If somebody else gives him more than that, then on your way, Ottawa fans. What do you think, right? And uh, much more interested in signing Norris up for a longer, what's he making, 9.25 or 925,000. Yes, he has had some injury problems, but he's probably the best center they have right now. And uh, 51 points in 61 games this year, I think I would rather sign him up to a longer term contract. It's been a, it's taken a while for him to get acclimated to the NHL, but this wouldn't be a bad gamble at five or six million for the next seven years or something like that. If he's willing to do that, I have a feeling Norris would probably gamble on himself here and uh, try to do a bridge, but, I'd be really pining to get him signed up long term, maybe even high as high as six and a half. Uh, if he's going to do a bridge, I guess you're going to go about three and a half or a couple. He stays at this point production, though. At the end of that deal, he's going to be looking at a heck of a lot more money than you would give him on a eight year deal right now. So that's the gamble you got to take. I think this would be the most interesting and difficult signing for the Ottawa Senators. What do you think, Ottawa? Do you think that uh, this is the most difficult signing? Do you think you should sign Tierney at all? Um, At what number would you sign him for? And what would you give for Norris and for how long? What do you think is best? Sub yourself up and let me know in the comments section. Uh... Why is that up here already? Okay. Philadelphia Flyers are next. And I guess Morgan Frost. It just so happens we had Morgan Frost there. Morgan Frost is the uh, most difficult signing of the Philadelphia Flyers. He has not progressed the way he wanted to, wanted to up until now, the way anybody wanted to. The Flyers, him, anybody. Uh, we'll look at his point production but I'm a Philadelphia Flyers fan in the East, and um, I can say that he has never really looked comfortable in the NHL as of yet. So I would say he's probably just going to get a qualifying offer if he gets anything at all. I would have to say that because he was one of their first round picks, um, in 2017, that they're going to give him a lot of rope. 
But let's take a look at it anyways. And who else? What about Owen Tippett? I think Owen Tippett would be the more difficult one. Um, but he'll probably get a bridge as well because he was buried in Florida. Didn't put up stellar, not stellar numbers yet. Hasn't had the greatest opportunity to be able to do that. I'm sure he'll get a little more than a qualifying offer for a year or two, gamble on himself to try to get a better contract. Same goes with Morgan Frost. Um, I guess the real question I'm asking you Philadelphia Flyers fans is, do they even do this? Remember, I'm doing this on the fly. Do they even give him any contract at all? Look at his numbers up until now. He's got speed, but... He's very small. He hasn't been able to build up much strength. And when he plays, he plays like a player that doesn't have the strength to be playing in the NHL. He had 19 points in 24 games in the AHL, which really isn't great numbers for a guy who's been around long enough now to be putting up better numbers than that as a uh, as a uh, player that was picked in the first round in 2017. Only 12 points in 50 games this year. Hasn't been all that great defensively. Hasn't been great offensively. I don't even see where he find the, there's a spot him on the roster at all. Give him a bridge. See what he does next year. Philadelphia has lots of time right now where they're basically in a retool anyways. Uh, see if he can build up his strength over the summer. What do you guys think, Philadelphia fans? Should Frost get anything more than what he has? Uh, what do you, what do you, I don't think he's done anything to get much more than league minimum at this stage of his career. Also, what about Tippett? What do you think about that? Uh, the good thing about the Philadelphia Flyers, as I just noticed here, is there isn't much to sign now. Um, Yandel's not going to be signed. Uh, you know, Frost and Tippett, that's probably why they put Frost in there. So it's going to be a relatively quiet year. I think they're going to spend more time trying to find a better backup for Carter Hart and maybe trying to sign some free agents that are on the younger side that can work on this retooling roster. Sub yourself up and let me know what you think, Philadelphia Flyers fans. Okay, next. Pittsburgh Penguins of Kenny Malkin. That is going to be a really difficult contract uh, but basically, Melkin holds all the cards here. Uh, he has been injured a lot. There has been questions about his desire and all kinds of stuff with Kenny Melkin. He's 35 years old. He made $9.5 million up until, uh, up until this year. Uh, but staying on the ice is proven difficult, as Mr. Steele says here, the writer from uh, Bleacher Report. So... What do you guys think in Pittsburgh? What do you think that uh, Malkin should get? I'm thinking that they're going to roll with uh, one-year contracts from now on. I even think Malkin might think that's a good idea. He's been really having a difficult time with injuries. I'm sure it's been a struggle. I'm not sure he even knows how long he's going to be in for. And... Um, when he's in the lineup, he puts up really good production. That's the thing. And if he can stay healthy for a year, he's shown that he can still be a point-to-game producer in the NHL. This year, in fact, uh, 37 points in 37 games. Thing is, he only played 37 games. A per-game bonus-laden contract, maybe maybe a points bonus-laden one-year contract at five and a half, possibility of getting up to eight or nine if you hit all those bonuses uh if you're able to if he's able to stay healthy and all that i think that's pretty much what i would be looking at i don't think that this may be even the toughest one though you got chris letang and apparently he said he's not taking a discount uh how much do they have? They have $29 million in cap space. That's the thing a lot of people don't realize with uh, Pittsburgh Penguins is they're known to be a team that's screwed cap-wise. But actually next year, they're not. They have a lot. They're going to have to sign Brian Rust, maybe. Um, is Brian Rust going to be moving on somewhere else? I doubt it. I think he's going to be looking for 7 or $8 million a year. He's been a point of game by guy, 30-goal scorer. This is going to be a big contract year for him. 
where he gets to get the big money at 58 points and 55 this year, 42 and 56. Uh, he's basically did everything that the team has asked him to do, and he's only do he was doing it on a $3.5 million contract. The only question I could see is if Pittsburgh themselves think, would Brian Russ do this anywhere else? Or is it because he was playing with Crosby where he was able to be so successful? Tell me what you think, Pittsburgh Penguins fans. What do you think? Do you think Brian Rust would be able to perform at that level on another team? Sub yourself up and let me know. How much do you think Brian Rust is going to ask for, be worth, in the, and how many years would you give him at 29 years old with his production up until now? I think on the open market, somebody would give him $7 to $8 million a year. I would not be surprised at all. The question for him is, is he going to take a little less to stay in Pittsburgh? Does he think that he has been fortunate enough to play on the Pittsburgh Penguins and that has contributed to a lot of his offense that he's made and that maybe he owes the Pittsburgh Penguins a little bit to take a contract a little less so they can run for a cup this year? If Malkin does what I just said and Russ does that, takes a little bit less, uh, you sign up Chris Letang and they still got probably somewhere around $10 million to fill out this roster even more. Maybe re-sign Raquel. Um, let me know, Pittsburgh Penguins fans, how much do you think Malkin is going to sign for? Is he going to sign at all? There's been talk about a, a possible retirement. Brian Rust, Kasperi Kapanen, the guy who has been on the fourth line a lot, has not, has not panned out at all. I'm not even sure that they're going to give him a qualifying offer. He could end up being a free agent, which would also free up more room to add a different type of player there as well. Lots of questions here in Pittsburgh. Latang, how much do you think he should get? Let me know, Pittsburgh Penguins fans, what all of these guys should get. Do you think they should get? Should they let any of them go? Should they uh, trade off somebody like Kasperi Kapanen if they can? Let me know in the sub yourself up and let me know in the comment section. I'd love to hear from you. Next, the San Jose Sharks and Alexander Barabanov. Um, there are a lot of contracts in San Jose that make this very difficult to decide what you're going to do with anybody, really. But Barabanov signed for one million dollars last year, gambled on himself, and didn't have all that bad. Of a year. Barabanov has established himself as an important cog in San Jose. Figuring out how to maintain his service will be paramount for this club during the offseason, as Mr. Steele writes here for Bleacher Report. Um, let's look at it. Barabanov, San Jose Sharks, making a million dollars this year. Uh, I, I think they have no choice but to sign the kid. How much? He's 27 years old. He has an opportunity to go out on the open market if he can. Uh, 37 points in 65 games is okay. He's kind of average to less than average defensively, but he is a point producer on a team that has struggled to put up points. I'm thinking he's going to get Three and a half to four million, somewhere around there, for a couple of years. Um, for his sake, I think he wants to gamble on himself a little bit too. If you believe in yourself, uh, take a shorter contract and see if you can put up better numbers next year and the year after that, maybe a two year deal. And then you could be looking at a much bigger contract after that. Possibly he's like, you know what? I like San Jose. Why don't you just give me three and a half for the next six, seven years? And I know I got three and a half million for the next six, seven years. And I know, you know, I have a good chance to stay in San Jose, which I love it here. I would strongly consider that. But on the same note, San Jose might be like, this could be just like a one time thing. He might go in the tank. And now we're paying a guy 3.5 who really isn't all that we thought he was. It's really going to come down I'd to, I believe, with San Jose is if they believe in this guy or not. My question to you, San Jose Sharks fans, is do you believe in this guy or not? 
Uh, do you believe that he can keep on putting those points up like that? Or do you think they should just put a little two, three-year deal, see what he is going to become so they don't get trapped into a contract that doesn't work out for them? Besides that, I think Mario Ferrero actually – now that I'm looking at this, and I was doing this completely on the fly, uh, I did this without looking at who was going to be next at every uh, on every team. That's going to be the one I think is more difficult than anything. Mario Ferrer Ferrero has been playing 20 minutes a night at times, 20, 25 minutes a night even sometimes. He's been playing on their top pair a lot. He doesn't put up huge points, but he was making minimum like what a million? Oh, he he's he's a restricted free agent, and uh, you could sign him to a bridge, and he becomes a free agent, or you can sign him up to like four or five million dollars for like six or seven years, which is what his production up until this point maybe looks like. If you could do that, I think he, I think San Jose's got to do it. I mean, he's been everything that they wanted him to be up until now. If you can get him for four or five now for a long contract, I think it's worth the gamble. What do you think, San Jose Sharks fans? Maybe even ask for more than that. That, to me, is a very difficult contract because if I'm Ferraro, I'm going, hey, you've been playing me top pair minutes. I want top pair money, and now you're in big trouble. Now he's looking for six seven million dollars a year and you got to ask yourself you got to say to him you got to say him to him to his face that if we had a better lineup you probably are a four or five guy we're only going to pay you as a four or five guy if you feel you are more than that then we'll give you a bridge and then you can test the free agent market and see if anybody gives you more than that he's got you by the short hairs a little bit though because there ain't much coming up in the pipe for san jose they don't really have a lot of younger defensemen that they can rely on for the next couple of years. They may have to pay through the nose for him. What do you think, San Jose Sharks fans? Both of these players, what do you think they should, how do you think San Jose should go about it with them? Uh, should they get bridges? Should they sign them long term? All of those things. Sub up and let me know in the comment section. What your thoughts are, because I love doing that sort of thing. And if you like this type of contract, co the type of uh, content like I do, sub up and talk to me about it in the comment section. Have a great day, everybody. That's my full 42. I'll be doing the rest of the teams next time on the NHL Perlow Wisdom Show.